thanks very much for coming this morning. I know it's uh, the last morning of the conference, and uh, so we had a late, late, late night last night, so I appreciate the attendance. And so here today just to share some more experiences in implementing AI-based automation. And um, just to start out with a, a few definitions. If you have questions, feel free to ask them during the presentation. The end. I don't know if I'll take the whole hour or not because I talk fast, but uh, we'll see how it goes this morning. So just uh, start all with the thing, defining fraud, waste, and abuse, which is always a focus of what I'm thinking about daisy solutions. So you know, fraud is claiming for services not delivered. Waste is uh, careless overuse of healthcare services, and abuse is providing services that are inconsistent with healthcare best practices. Can't you can't hear? Standing up, I go, okay, is that better? Yeah. Okay, I should hug the mic. So in, in, in terms of the opportunity AI, I hear a lot of hype about AI and a lot of us actually, actually hate that word. I don't want to shoot myself every time I hear it in the media, but uh, I think it's technology that's useful to help people. I think really is what it is. It's overblown in terms of what its capabilities are. Uh, we, we ascribe too much to the word, but uh, regardless, uh, we have technology that enables um, some opportunity for automation, right? So I think the challenge in the insurance industry is that there's not enough expert staff, adjudicators, adjusted, you know, investors, underwriters, um, to review every single quote, fraud alert, or claim that comes in. So a lot of things get processed with no with no review at all, right? And I think that's the opportunity. If we can use technology um, in, in a way to automate some you know, some decision making, there's an opportunity to review these claims that are otherwise just paid or processed. And so I think the previous generation of automation uh, technology is really about doing what's always been done. And so if there is automation, it's just doing very simple things. Um, and, and I think most claims in group health benefits are just processed without being looked at. They meet some certain criteria. It's a standard looking claim. It doesn't get looked at because you can't look at every claim right at the, at the level. You, know, you have thousands of claims. It's not like PNC where you might get one claim of a customer every five years, you're going to get claims passed every month from almost every client. So the volume is, is too large. And when we say automation, that doesn't mean you need to turn 100% of the process over to technology. It's about um, having technology assist people. Um, some of the claims and, 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 and quotes can be processed completely automatically, but it's about tiering human to touch. So can we reduce the cost um, of, of processing a claim by, by giving your most skilled people the most complex things to look at, the most material things to look at, maybe administrative review for some moderately complex or lower materiality things, and then automating the simple things that are, uh, that are, that are high volume but low value. And so if you do this, you, you can minimize the cost, and then you can also improve the process performance by, if the technology is good, it'll make better decisions more consistently, it won't make mistakes, it'll apply the same logic over. So there's an opportunity to both reduce the cost of processing plus improve process performance. And that's what Daisy's focus has been for the last 10, 15 years. So we talk about automation, I think there's this fear of replacing people. I think it's in the media a lot, and I think uh, you know, the idea of automation means we're going to eliminate the human being. I think that's not the goal. We see it in some simple tasks, like if you look at walk into a McDonald's these days, you don't go to the counter to order anymore. There's a, ordering screen you walk to and I think that's a little unfortunate where they're maybe replacing high school kids and, and uh, with computer systems and that's where there's a very simple task. It's a very simple road task. You're ordering a meal. There's not a lot of complex logic there. But you can't continue to do this where there's a need to add people to a task where it's where uh, like in the insurance industry you can't just go hire a, a, you know, a thousand investigators. So how do you go look at more claims? The only way to do that is really to look at technology. So if we hear about um, you know, intelligent automation, I think the, the goal is to elevate people. You know, human beings are the boss. So this AI human interface, and I'll give examples of what, what that means. But the idea is that you know, human is the boss, human sets the objectives, it's not replacing people, it's maybe changing job roles. That that's that's what's happening. And it feels like you you might people are fear of losing their job because maybe half of their job role is changing and it feels like a job loss, but it's not. It's like, can we find other tasks uh, to put people to? Um, 
where you know, people are better at it. I mean, computers are good at computing and always have been that way. And I think so we have really complex logic. I think complex logic is really beyond human ability to apply. So if you're looking at a single claim and you're saying, is this fraud or not as an investigator, you know, that's a nearly impossible task. What a computer would do is compare that claim to the 100 million claims that have come before it to compare on every single attribute. We'll combine that to all the peer groups. We'll do like 100 billion comparisons. Well, a person can't do that. Will the computer do a better job? Yes, because it's doing something that people can't do. And I think those are the types of tasks we want to automate or use technology. Use technology to do what people can and let people do what people can do and people are good at. There's certain things computers can do. Computers don't understand what they're doing. This is applying logic. You know, so let people do the strategy, uh, customer service, more strategic, high value things, let the computer take care of these brute force comparisons, right? But I think the, the, the challenge so far has been, and we've, I've been at this for 15, 20 years in the insurance industry, is how do you build trust in the technology, right? How do you, that's the issue. The issue is do you trust the technology? Do you, will you let the technology make a decision and trust it? So how do we build that trust? How do you guarantee that there will be positive business outcomes? And I think that's kind of the goal of this talk is to kind of share how we can show and guarantee that there will be positive business outcomes. So you can build the trust so you can start to turn over some of this decision making to technology. So we'll talk first about kind of a causal theory, like to make systematic decision making and where there's complex logic, you need some kind of theory of the world. And uh, talk about, you know, like uh, this example, I'm an aerospace engineer and I'm gonna geek out on this kind of stuff. So orbital mechanics to predict planet locations, this is how it happened historically. Way back when, in the time of Greeks, they thought the Earth was the center of the universe and all the planets and sun revolved around the Earth. And when they were trying to predict planetary locations, uh, the red, uh, the pink graph at the bottom, the vertical axis is error rate, and the horizontal axis is volume of data collected. So you have the wrong theory. After you collect a certain amount of data about the locations of the planets, the error will not get any better because you have the wrong theory. So this idea of we're always talking about collect more data, it's all about the data collection. Well, that's not true. It's only true up to a point if you have the right theory that's, that, that you're applying. So the, the theory of Earth is a center of the universe was wrong, and beyond a certain point, the more data you collected, the error doesn't change. Then Ptolemy in the, in the Middle Ages noticed that some of the planets do retrograde motion based on what side of the sun you're on. You, know, you can see Mars and those kind of loops in the sky. And so and he thought that the planets do epicycles around the Earth. The Earth is still the center of the universe. And that was a horrible theory. No matter how much data you collected, you notice the error rate was pretty much flat. Then came Copernicus and said, you know what, it's the sun is actually the center of the universe and all the planets revolve around the sun. And that was a much better theory. And with very little data, got to an error rate, and then beyond that, the error rate was flat. And the last one was uh, Kepler said that the planets do elliptical orbits around the sun. And with very little data, you got to the right answer, and the error rate dropped. And then Einstein came along and needed even less data. And so the point here is it's not about collecting data. It's about having the right theory of how the world works. And so the idea, if you're going to apply complex systematic logic, it's not about collecting data. It's about defining what it is that uh, uh, defines what you're trying to do. So the systematic logic behind the theory of risk, and in case of fraud or risk, or you know, when you're underwriting, it's about risk, about payability. It's you know, you know, risk is hard to find outliers. Right, so this picture of the rocks here says, you know, what's an outlier? Well, there's an obvious one. There's that kind of orange rock in the middle. But then if you think about it, you know, there's other colors. So you can peer group the rocks into colors. You can peer group them by size. You can peer group them by shape. You can peer group them by do they have any damage or not or discontinuities. So what is an outlier? You know, if you picked a single rock, is that an outlier with respect to which peer group? To which peer group? So that's a theory that anything that's risky is different than the norm. Anything that's fraud is different than the norm. That's one one theory. And the next one is if you make better decisions about fraud, risk, um, and underwriting and payability, that'll lead to profitability. So better decision making, identifying more fraud, reducing identifying the risk correctly and pricing that correctly. If you do those things, that will lead to better business outcomes. So that's the theory of risk. 
you can express this mathematically, and that becomes kind of a causal theory that we want to use um, to systematically apply this logic to identify fraud, risk, and variability. The other thing required for intelligent automation is to create leading indicators. So, so a leading indicator would be something that's predictive of the outcome. The outcome, the financial result, is a lagging indicator that happens after the fact that lags time. That's what's called a lagging indicator. And so you want to have leading indicators that are correlated to the outcome by right, some way, and you want your AI to be predictive of the outcome. So if I say this is a highly risky uh, claim, you should, um, or a highly likely fraudulent claim or suspicious claim, then you should not pay that claim, right? And so you're predicting the outcome before it has happened. You want this, these indicators to be very atomic. You want them to be right at the level of the decision you make. So in the insurance industry, you want it to be right at the level of the claim or at the level of the provider, um, so you're at, or at the level of the quote. So you're providing an indication that you can use to make a decision. You want it to be stable. If your theory is any good, it should be valid all the time, like, like 10 years ago it should work, and today it should work. Should be forward-looking, should give you enough time to act on it so you can act on it before the outcome happens. And technology should be able to execute that action. It should not necessarily require a human ability to execute it. So these are the leading indicators. And what you want is AI to create those leading indicators for you, to create that systematic decision making. That's what the purpose of AI should be. It's a system that creates an indicator that gives you a recommendation on what to do. Not build a random predictive model with a score. It should be if you have this score, this is what you should do. Like that's the level you want to get to. Make a recommended decision that's actionable, that's systematic, and consistent. So, you know, that's you know, so how does technology and AI relate to decisions and leading indicators? So I'll give you a couple of examples in the real world. So, so you know, so Neil Armstrong, we say he landed the lunar lander on the moon. In actuality, he did not. The computer landed. What Neil did was he was the boss. He said, this is what I want to do. I want to go over there, and I want to go this fast. So he input the instructions into the computer. And then on the, on the lunar lander, there's like 16 retro rockets that fire in, in every, on every corner and in every direction. And so and that, those things fire 100 times a second. So it's beyond human ability to fire 100 times a second, you know, 16 retro rockets. So the computer did that. So Neil put in the instructions, the computer executed the glory details that were beyond human ability. So that's one analogy for the technology. Humans, the boss, sets the goal, the computer takes care of the glory details that, that people are unable to, to do because it's way too complex. Another example would be an autonomous race car. If you built a physical race car, how would you train this car to drive? You wouldn't build a car with an empty brain and say, put it on a track and say, drive, right? You'd break a million cars and before it were to drive, you would do it. It would, uh, it would crash a gazillion times. So how do you train the brain of a car to drive? You train it in a computer simulation. So the implication is you have a simulation of the way the world works. There's no idea of historical data, this you know, idea of labels or not labels. So like the idea, this is a good millisecond, this was a bad millisecond, like that doesn't exist. There's no concept of that. There is historical data. You use it to configure your simulation. So in the case of the race car, it would be the force of gravity, the density of the air, the friction of the rubber on the road. So that's the historical data. It configures your simulation. And then the software says, what's the optimal sequence of steering, brake, gas pedal to get me the fastest lap around a racetrack? And so the analogy to business is, if you're a business, is a lap around a racetrack. We know there's strong seasonality that happens in, in the industry. You know, we have flus and illness in the fall and winter in Canada. Uh, most policies end on an annual basis, so there's some kind of end and beginning of policy information. All of that kind of stuff. So there's seasonality. So a year of business is like a lap around a racetrack. And what are the decisions? It's the sequence of uh, what's what's the quote for this uh, premium or, or this uh, you know, what's the premium for this quote request? Should I pay this claim or not? Is it fraud or not? Those are the granular decisions that are made every single day that impact the profitability. So it's the sequence of those decisions over the course of the year that determine the performance of an uh, insurance company. So you put all this stuff together, really all human decision making is about 
what decisions should I make to get the desired output? And this is kind of an engineering, it's closed loop control. This is what NASA has been doing since the 1950s and 60s and what the era of the aerospace uh, military aviation does. Today, what drones and robots and autonomous cars do, it says, given some theory, in the case of all those engineering systems, it's the laws of physics. In the case of business, you need to create a theory of risk, which is if it's an outlier, it's likely risky or fraud. And if you make better decisions around risk and fraud and claims automation, you'll make more money. That's the theory. Now it says, what decisions should I make about each incoming claim, each quote request? Those decisions will impact the outcomes. And so you want to simulate. You say, if I did this, what would happen? That's the simulation you're simulating to try to come up with what's the optimal set of decisions to make. And you measure what happens in the real world and keep that back in the system. You can do this. This is how the system works. And the technology will then create a decision recommendation. So a claim comes in and the system will go, um, that is not fraudulent, um, but it's a high value claim. We should do an adjudication, so we need to give it to a human adjuster to review. So it's not payable. Historically, we haven't straight through processed that claim. So although it's not fraudulent, I don't want to straight through process it. Cue that to a person to review. Maybe it's a simple administrative check, validate the claim documents, or it can be a more complex check to somebody more senior and adjuster to do a more in-depth review. Or if it's not fraudulent, but we've historically always paid this type of claim, it's $200, we don't need to look at it, I can straight through process that, put that into the claim queue to automatically process it. If it's fraud, I don't pay it, put it to the SIU queue to look at, or if it's a really low value claim, like my favorite dental claim, which is if you charge an emergency visit for replaning or scaling, you know, you don't need to look at that. You can just recode it with a recall visit and process that with no human touch. Most insurance companies still will just pay that. I mean, I'm frustrated. Some of my clients just pay that. I wish they wouldn't uh, because it's a, it's a no brainer. We all agree. But there's that fear of turning that decision over to the, over to the technology. So how does this work? I mean, so here's a, uh, you know, an example. So we, you know, Daisy's AI creates kind of a suspicion index for fraud. So as a claim comes in, we'll in real time can provide a suspicion index on that. Recall last year I talked about explainability. We can decompose the suspicion index into an explanation of why we think that's fraudulent or not. And using this approach, the false positive rates are quite low. So when you have, we have a score between zero and a thousand, so a thousand being very suspicious, zero being not suspicious. So in the top and when a score of greater than 950 has a, typically a false positive rate of about 10%, which is pretty good. If you're doing predictive modeling, false positive rates are typically 50 to 90%. And, uh, that's just the way the math works. You know, if you have a 1% of claims are fraudulent um, and you have a 90% accurate model, you will have a 90% false positive rate. That's just the way it works. That's, that's why medicine tells you to get a second opinion. You know, uh, I think the uh, Efficacy of an HIV test is like uh, it has an eight percent error, so it's ninety-two percent accurate. If you get a diagnosis with HIV, there's only an eight percent chance that you actually have it. You know, you had a positive test that's ninety-two percent accurate because it's a one percent of the population has it. If you do the math, it turns out that that's why doctors always say when you get a diagnosis, go get a second opinion because they know this false positive rate. So. Fraud is a, is a rare event, and predictive models generate a huge false positive rate, and that's a huge problem with AI, and probably a lot of, that's why there's a lot of cynicism around a lot of the AI systems, because it's false positive rate, your investigators get bored and doing wild goose chases, right? So you need to have some different approach to what we're talking about here, which drives a much lower false positive rate. 10% of the top of the, of the, of the claims, 30% false positive rate, but the scores between 875 and 90, and then 47% when it's between 750 and 875. So you can use this and there's a curve that goes all the way to the bottom and you can decide where you want to cut off. If you want to say, I only want to automate claims that have a score of 950 or more, that's what, that's what we would set up a process and automate that. And if it's a large dollar amount, then no, you want to always want to give that to a human being. If it's not, uh, it's a small dollar amount, just auto-process it. 
On the payability side, the false positive rates on payability are much smaller. It's less, it's not as rare of an event. Fraud might be, you know, that kind of 3 to 10 percent of claims, and we always hear about fraud, waste, and abuse. But the payability is a, a much lower false positive. So, the top scores that are greater than 950, we only see a 1 percent false positive rate. False positive rate compared to historical payments, if assuming your historical payments are correct. So, so there's a 1 percent disagreement ability and 5% in the middle of the thing, 21% of the bottom. And then using the Daisy Risk Index when you're looking at quotes, you know, the, the top 950 scores are above, about 43% of the claims occur in the top, very top part of the high risk identified claim, which makes sense. Your risk uh, quotes and policies are where most of your claims occur. 32% occur in the middle band, 12% bottom and then you have to add those numbers up to 100 percent the rest of it uh, falls out in the, in the bottom. So these leading indicators are strongly correlated to the outcome. It's at the level of the decision you want to make. Is this claim suspicious or suspicious or not? Should I investigate it? Is this claim payable or not? Should I straight through process it or do I need to adjudicate it? And what's premium should I quote on the claim? That's what the risk index is for. So whatever AI systems you use, whatever indicators it creates, you need to Define how do I act on it? And that's the logic you should be pushing your technology vendors. Great, that's a high predictive model score. Great, it broke this rule. What do I do? Do I do something with that? Okay, I investigate. Well, what should I investigate? Is it explainable? You know, uh, have some explanation as to why is it suspicious? Why is it payable? Why is it risky? So if you do do a human review, you have some guidance. And if, it's, and if it uh, meets the criteria of high confidence, Low complexity, low, uh, low materiality, then let the machine just take care of build that trust. Off of no, no brainer examples like the dental example, right? That's a no brainer. You should just let the technology do that, see it makes no mistakes, and then add another one like that. There's probably five other rules that are just like that dental recall example. You can simply automate. An example of payability this was another client where we did. Uh, um, we processed about 40,000 claims. We're doing this daily batch, so we would get all the claims for a single day. And then Daisy would score it and provide a decision recommendation for fraud, not fraud, pay, not pay, with that decision index and then an explanation. Um, and, and if uh, the client wanted to look at it, they could go to the case management tool and see all the explanations. So historically, there's about 40,000 claims were scored, and 35,000 uh, the customer kind of adjudicated looked at it. Using the DAISY indicators, there's been a regular adjudication where the human looked at it and there's high payability. So prior to this, this was like complex travel medical claims. So, you know, slipped on a banana peel in Barbados, smashed the face with the hospital, that kind of claim, right? Uh, so we were at only 5% straight through processing. And so with the payability index, we increased that to 30%. So almost a, like a 500% increase in payability by using the technology, setting some rules that it was below a certain dollar amount and had less than you know, two invoices attached to the claim, so it wasn't, it wasn't a complex claim, increased payability by, by that 500%. So the regular adjudication happened, and so when we looked at the historical payment accuracy compared to historical payments, it was about 82% agreed with the historical payment patterns and, and about 18% uh, were, were, were disagreeing with historical payments. So if you, the, the client wanted to use the historical payments, even though we said your historical payments may not be correct either, but that was the base that we measured on, so it had an 82% accuracy there. And so this resulted in about a $20 to $30 savings per claim in terms of claim processing, right, which, which is huge. So this now allows the same number of people to look at more things, which is what, like what you want to do. It's not eliminate those people. It's, it's give them more to do because most things just get paid without looking at it. So that's the point on this, on this page. And where I said it's about elevating people, giving them lower false positive rate things to look at is good, good for the person doing the job. They don't feel like they're wasting their time. And that's what I just call that elevating. Allow you to apply your expertise and skill. That's what the technology should elevate people, support them to be able to do what they're really good at. By the technology doing what it's good at, these brute force computations, that's how you divide the world. It's not like the McDonald's scenario. I'm not trying to make money at McDonald's. This is just trying to make money, but I, I, I hate that they're replacing high school kids with a lot of people who are But as a family, we're McDonald's. At the same
same customer, we were looking at fraud, the fraud. At the same time, we were scoring the payability, we were scoring the fraud. So historically, we had recovered about $100,000 a year in fraud recoveries. It was about a $400 million local business. Um, so we had a pilot where we looked at the 40,000 claims. We quadrupled the amount of fraud recoveries to 400,000, again, using the Daisy Suspicion Index. And then we, um, when you expand the scope of the pilot to the full year, if you annualize those numbers, it was about Four and a half million dollars, and of that, 1.7 million would meet the criteria on its automation. You do have no human review. Um, then, kind of the middle third was doing an administrative review. You don't need to do a full investigation. You need to validate a few documents, and then the bottom third was put back to an investigator. Kind of investigator review. So, um, again, that's the tiering that human touch is what we want to do with automation. So that's what automation. It's not about replacing. Every decision, it's like you know, using the computer to do what it does well, letting people do what they do well. And so here we increase recoveries by a thousand percent. So that's the talk today. Happy to have any answer any questions that you have. Uh, if you scan the QR code for the next month or two, it'll go get a patent talking about the ability to control the technology. If you have insomnia and you want to go sleep late, the patent is just 35 minutes. Happy to answer any questions if you have any questions this morning. It's going to super fast now. Okay, so how is Daisy using learning machine versus predictive modeling in its AI solutions? Yeah, so, so, like I said, we use this theory of retail, so like we have, we have a set of differential equations that we presented and we use um, what's called reinforcement learning, which is that kind of closed loop that engineering diagram that said that if you do this, what will happen? We're not using labels. We don't have this, we don't have to have historical labels. So we're we're looking at the claim to say, is this different than the norm? And so if you have a if you have a claim, you can create thousands of attributes from the claims data. So you can describe that claim in many ways. We can say, you know, what type of claim is it? What's the dollar amount? Um, you can then say what are all similar claims? Paired on those thousand attributes, you say how different is this claim than the average, and that difference can be quantified. We can apply a score to it, and if uh, and if you're tracking a thousand attributes and it's different than the norm, it's impossible to manufacture a false positive out of it. So you think of each variable is has a has like ninety nine percent wrong. If it's wrong ninety nine percent of the time, but you have a thousand independent variables, a thousand. 0.99 to the power of a thousand is zero. So the error rate becomes zero the more things you look at. And if the fraudsters don't know how each of those variables is distributed in your database, it's impossible for them to manufacture a record that looks normal. So that's the sophisticated outlier detection we do. We compare every claim, and a single claim and a provider can belong to multiple peer groups. Like a claim could be could be a dental claim. Dental claim for children it could be a dental claim at a clinic in an urban setting. It could be a dental claim done by a specialist. It could be a dental claim at the end of the year. It could be a dental claim in July. So one claim can belong to ten peer groups, and so it's doing all of these comparisons to say on um, these thousand features is this an outlier? Is it different than every other claim that's in that peer group? And that's where by doing these brute force comparisons, it's impossible to manufacture something. Looks normal because the fraudsters don't have these you know, statistical tools and data to do that. So that's what the Daisy system does. It measures these outliers and then simulates if I don't pay this, what will happen? Get, uh, what, what's the savings that I create? So we're trying to say what are the best decisions given I have 10 investigators and I can look at 100 things a week. What are the best 100 I should look at to make the most money? Can't, still can't look at everything unless you let the system decide. So that's kind of how the Daisy system works. We do use predictive modeling in the system, but it's it just creates another variable. Right? So predict, because predictive modeling has high false positive rates, if the average person has three claims a year that have a high score, and a, a new person comes in and they have three records that have a high score, well, that's likely a false positive rate. That's the average number of records that you have. So. If a person has six records that have a high predictive model score, and that's twice as more than the average, so 
they're an outlier with respect to predictive models in sports. So we just use a predictive model as another feature that we say, are you different than the norm or not? And that comparison of different to the norm removes some of the false positive effects. So that's how Daisy eliminates the false positive effect or minimizes it. Can I ask a question on top of that? So your peer grouping, is your peer grouping based on the claim level as opposed to a priority? people level, yeah. yeah. we do it at every level. So we have, like, so if, like, so if you organize an entity hierarchy, there's the claim, yeah. then there's the people associated with the claim, the patient, yeah. then the patient has a family, yeah. then above the, above there's a provider, and then above that there's a social network. So we do the score and peer grouping at every level, at the claim level, at the people level, at the family level, at the provider level, the clinic level, the social network level. So when we look at multiple peer groups uh, just to see, is this a provider behavior? Is it a clinic behavior? Is it a, right? How do you peer group family? Because there's so many attributes. Like, the very, there's so many all variables. And so we create multiple peer groups. And we look at family composition, like whatever attributes you have. Like, so you don't have a lot of attributes. So we would have the age of family, is there, Number of people in the household, where geographically where they are, their census demographics. You know, you can like neighborhood living with 2,000 census variables. You know, where they have family, you have age of do they have children or not, you know, what, you know, all of those kind of attributes. So we would we would over maybe get overly complex, but you just look at you know, maybe like four or five things, which is composition, age. Because I think age of patient has a impact on what type of services. Of, child will receive different services than adults, so it's usually the age of the patient and number of people by age band. So, so that's a strong peer group is the age of the patient. Well, does DAISY integrate third-party source of data to integrate in this model? And we use mostly internal data. I think uh, I think that's where you, know, you don't have to, it's not the C hunt for data. If you have your like, and take advantage of all of your internal data first. Certainly, you could augment that with some other, we know that credit risk data has an impact on insurance risk, and you could bring that in. Some of the census data, if you want additional attributes about the patients and neighborhoods and things like that. But for the most part, I think 95% of the value comes from your own data. Like if you're gonna predict solar flares, you're not gonna use data about traffic to predict solar flares, even though they may be related very, like, Last example is like, uh, you know, ice cream sales are up in summer, murder rates are up in summer, therefore you should eliminate ice cream because it's going to impact murder rates. Well, yes, those are yeah. the true, it, but it's not causation, right? So if you want to optimize a process, use data about the process. This idea that you can go collect all this data off the internet and outside, like, that's a myth. That's just IT companies wanting to sell you storage. And they, when they got to the early 2000s and they invented big data because they realized as Moore's Law was doing this and increasing the performance of computing, that their computer sales would go down the toilet. So they invented big data and all breathed the side of the week because they said, let's collect every claim, every social media, what everybody had for breakfast and tell everyone that that's what you need to do to succeed. And I showed you the orbital mechanics examples. If you have the right theory, you actually need no data. Einstein's theory of relativity, he discovered that 100 years ago. He had no computers, no data, sat there, thought about it out of his brain, and it took 100 years and three data points to validate this theory. There was no big data. That's how science has worked for hundreds of years. Human beings come up with a theory based on the knowledge of the day, and then you get the data you need to validate the theory. And then you iterate to say the theory worked or it didn't work. It's not, I have this huge pool of data, therefore it must explain the universe. That's totally backwards. So somehow the computer scientists have turned scientific logic around. Like there's not a single thing in our world that has been built with a predictive model. Predictive modeling is a great tool, but the chair you're sitting in, the room we're in, the lights, the computers, we're all invented with scientific theories like the laws of physics. Statistical analysis did not invent anything. It's been a tool for experimental analysis and to generate ideas, but it's not the panacea that the world is claiming and telling you that it is. Predictive modeling has been invented in 1805. If it was the panacea, it would have run its course by now. That's my feeling. I feel this scientific method getting back to how the theory to explain anything. It doesn't have to be at the level of like, 
Einstein's theory. Like our theory is nowhere near that. I'm not claiming anything like that, but just a, a theory that my hypothesis is this: an outlier is fraud or risk. And if you make good decisions, you'll make more money. That's as simple as a theory. It sounds very common sense, and it works. People are able to generate huge value from that. So that's the scientific method, and that's the method we espouse, as opposed to just build a predictive model, of course, on data, and the magic happens. But that's a fallacy. I'm not sure many of you have experienced that with a uh, uh, predictive model builders. Not to slam them, you know, that's the status quo of what education is teaching people, but it's wrong. I'll probably be dead before the world realizes it. That's my belief today. Space for about 30 years. I think mean, I had the what the world is going through today. I had that moment by myself 30 years ago. So I had the accident. I was at U of T with Jeffrey Hinton, my father of deep learning, and it was all the lectures in the 1980s. And I got excited by the space back then. So, but I learned along the way that it doesn't really work the way it's supposed to work. Uh, does Daisy integrate third party source of data to integrate in its own? I'll move. Okay. That's why I flipped on you. That's okay. okay. How many years of data does Daisy require to train its model to generate a claim? So I guess a little less you do. So we don't have a model. So the idea is we have like the laws of physics that exist independent of any data. So you know, of course there's mass time acceleration is like Newton's law. So we have an equation like that, and then we get data that we plug in, we calculate the gravitational constant or the peer groups. So we use the data to calculate peer groups and what the distribution of each feature is. So that's what we use the data for. So it's not really like building a model from the data, it's populating our theory with things we learn from your data. So ideally, we'd like to have at least two years of data because that gives you a seasonal cycle. So if the world is like a lap around a racetrack, a year of business, having you know, two years of seasonality gives us that seasonal view. That's the only reason you want history is to get seasonality and how things vary over time. So we'll take as many years of history as we can. Most of our clients have given us five plus years of history. Uh, but the technology can work with as little as a month of data, but you'll just miss in that month of data to seasonality. So, uh, so, so. It's not because it's not a predictive model. We don't need like long, continuous history of labeled data and unlabeled data. You know, and most of our clients don't track the fraud labels or anyways, so it's not like that data has a proliferation of that data. Anyways. So a little is one month, ideally several years. You know, we like data, so the more you give us the more those seasonal patterns. Can all the results I shared with you were actually in the middle of a pandemic? It was for travel management insurance. So in the middle of the pandemic, the world totally changed in the travel industry. We were able to get 500% increase in straight food processing, more than 1,000% increase in fraud recoveries, even though the patterns were completely different than they were six months before. Because it's not a data problem. It's having the right theory. That's, that's the thing. If it was a data problem, all the data systems did not work during the pandemic and are still struggling because they're going, how do I adjust for the pandemic, which is in the middle of my five years of history, because that screws everything up in terms of the data-based So if you have the right approach, then it lives through these data changes, the world changes, patterns change. An outlier is an outlier, whether it's a pandemic or not. Any other questions? Don't be shy. If not, I'll be hanging around for a little bit. Finish your breakfast and thank you very much for coming this morning.